All right, now we're going to get down to business. Uh, our presenters today are going to be Guy Leeser and Steve McGreevy. Uh, Guy is a former air traffic control specialist at Chicago Center and a former FAA flight inspection pilot who retired from the FAA in 2013 with 34 years of service. Uh, he holds an ATP certificate, CFII, MEI, IGI, and 7,000 plus hours of PIC. He owns Guy Leeser Aviation at Aurora Municipal Airport, specializes in IFR training in advanced technology aircraft. I'm sorry if my name badge is blinding you, the lights are reflecting off of it. Um, he's a lead fast team representative for the DuPage FISDO. I told them not to do that while I'm pre presenting, but they didn't listen. <laughs> Uh, Steve McGreevy is a former air traffic control specialist at Chicago Center who retired April 2017 after 33 years of service. Active member of EAA Chapter 1414, pilots his own Cessna 170. He's a fast team representative for the DuPage FISDO. Uh, these guys worked together for many years at Chicago Center. In 2012, they received the Archie League Medal for safety and for vectoring a pilot in severe icing conditions without navigation instruments to a successful landing. In 2016, Steve received the ATCA Presidential Citation of Merit Award for yet another flight assist involving a VFR pilot who was trapped above an IFR deck. Uh, they've been conducting safety programs together for more than 25 years. They're active speakers in the Great Lakes region on a number of topics related to air traffic operations and IFR flying. So, if you would, <coughs> please give it a big air venture welcome for Guy Leeser and Steve McGreevy. Come on up, guys. And since we acknowledge that the both of you are really good friends of the FAST team, we wanted to give you a certificate of appreciation for helping us out here today. Thank you, Jason. And uh, we're I glad to you have guys. you. I'm presenting Steve here. He's giving my... <laughs> <laughs> it's Monday. I gave them the wrong one. <laughs> That's all right. I'll be Just better by Friday. Thank you, Jason. Welcome, everybody. <clears throat> How's your adventure treating you so far? Yeah. It's a beautiful day, right? Couldn't be better. This is the best weather we've had in years. You know, usually by this time of the day, it's a great time to do a presentation because everybody's coming in from the, the heat and they're all dragged out and tired. And I'm sure if you're like me, I'm already dragged out and tired just from walking around, right? That's right. Yep. Steve's, Steve's way down on the other end there, so he's got a long way to walk to get up here every day. We're really glad to be here today. Steve and I have been doing this for a while. Um, I've been flying uh, since I was 13 years old. I started at, uh, taking lessons. It's, I used to be a bus boy and save my money and pedal my bike out to the airport, take a lesson, go back, save some more. And, it, and when I think when I sold it when I was 16, I had about 100 hours of duel. So um, this is all I've ever done is air traffic and, and flying. Steve's got a similar background. I waited a little bit longer to learn to fly. I hired with the FAA first as an air traffic controller. I met a guy. He was my flight instructor in the 80s, and uh, we've had a lifelong friendship since and uh, have developed some of these uh, uh, speaking engagements to talk to pilots and relate some of the air traffic experience that we have and, uh, and how there's some transfer there between IFR flying and air traffic control. And really that's, that's the topic for today. This is uh, strategic versus tactical IFR. Sounds real technical, but it's really not. We're gonna share some observations with you, but there's two studies that I use here. One is from uh, NASA and the other ones from Purdue that kind of make up the gist of this uh, specific presentation. Um, what I'd like you to keep in mind though, uh, interestingly enough, I've been teaching flying lessons since 1979 and I, when I started with the FAA as a controller in 1981, um, we were checked out and immediately training controllers, right? Training controllers and training pilots is very similar in some respects. You know, it's a same kind of environment, um, but that's where a lot of this came from. We started, I started to look over the years at the similarities and some of the common things that are involved in training pilots and flying and training controllers and controlling airplanes. So today's topic is going to be a little bit about both of that. So we thought we'd give you a little glimpse, you know, on the flying side, obviously, but also the controller side of this as well. And that's, I'll let Steve talk about that. He graduated last. Yeah. But <clears throat> let's get to know our audience. We always do this first. How many student pilots do we have in the room today? I know we got one, potentially, right? How about uh, private or recreational pilots, sport pilots, anybody? Okay, we're narrowing it down. How about private pilots? Good. All right, anybody here fly into the show? Excellent, awesome. That's a cool thing, isn't it? Any first timers today or this, this year, first time flying in? 
it's a lot of fun. All right, how about uh, commercial braided pilots here? Excellent. We got a good group, Steve. Yep. All right, next we got uh, flight instructors. All right, cheers for flight instructors. Let's give these guys a hand. Now, I'll tell you what, we do not have enough flight instructors today. We're running out of flight instructors quickly. Airline transport guys here? Excellent. We got a good crowd, like I said. All right. Out of all of you out there, how many people here are IFR current? Excellent. Next question. How many of you are IFR proficient? <laughs> all right. Okay, well, we'll you, you'll get to it. You'll understand this here in a little bit, all right? This is, to in my mind anyway, this is what currency might look like, right? <laughs> when you're out there flying and it's IFR, all right? And then this is what proficiency should look like, <laughs> right? I don't know what, you know, a currency is, you know, we have the six approaches and the holding, intercept, all that stuff, and I don't know what proficiency is. It's different for everybody, right? Well, we can all be current, but I'm not sure you want to go out and fly hard, hard IFR, right? But anyway, the difference is simply practice. And if you can't practice a lot, then you've got to make sure you've got a good one of these. <laughs> all right? Everybody remember Otto? And, but, and since we're at Oshkosh, I had to throw this in because I think he's signing autographs over in the Boeing booth. <laughs> Do you know that the autopilot has been around since 1914? It's invented by Spiri. So it's been around a really long time. So we're gonna, sh we're gonna talk about these things today. IFR strategies for flying IFR and tactical responses to things. And we're also gonna touch on what's happening from the controller's point of view uh, during situations like that. And again, there's a lot of crossover between uh, proficiency and currency, even when it comes to air traffic. All right, so here's the topic. Actually, my slides must be translated a little differently on their program up there. The pictures didn't show up, but that's okay. Strategic versus tactical IFR. A lot of similarities here in these environments. Um, Steve and I are both center controllers. Uh, we worked at Chicago Center together during our controlling time, and that, that's all IFR environment, just, you know, it's a all 100% IFR. And you know, <clears throat> that environment is, it's like uh, going to the bat cave every single day, right? Being a controller is a great thing. It's never the same every day. It's different uh, circumstances, different weather, different traffic flows, depending on where you sit, what time of day, you're just basically sitting down and working traffic. You know the difference between a center guy, you can tell the difference between a center guy and a tower guy, controller, right? You know how? Center guys are like us, we're kind of pale and, you know, not, not very, not very tan, but this is what a tower guy looks like. See, this is the tower guys. They all look cool. They got the, the sunglasses and the tan. We don't get that in the center. We spent a lot of time there, right, Steve? Yeah, we did. Uh, and we worked together for quite a few years, and uh, we're fortunate enough to get to know each other in, uh, in, in flying and in air traffic control. So uh, it, it, that helps, that teamwork uh, environment it helps both in the cockpit and uh, you know, in air traffic, we work as teams too, so. You know, the air traffic environment is a little bit different in that as an air traffic controller, you don't have the ability to say, I don't want to control traffic today, right? When you go to work, you just accept what it is. And when you get up in the morning, you're looking at the weather because that's what you do every single day. The weather impacts our, our traffic day to day more than anything else. As a pilot though, you have decisions. You can make, you can decide not to fly, right? You can look at the weather, say, hey, it's not for me. Maybe you're not on that proficiency scale anywhere. Here's a couple guys, one of these you know for sure, right? Both these guys are instrument rated. One's got 25,000 hours of flying time. This guy over here on the right, he's, he's a brand new instrument pilot, right? We got any brand new instrument pilots out here? Nobody's brand new, okay. The, the trick is there is that from our standpoint in air traffic as a controller, these guys are exactly the same. When you check the box on a flight plan saying you're IFR certified, we have no way in the air traffic business of knowing what level of air, uh, IFR proficiency you're at. Right? IFR is IFR, right? And this is what it looks like to us. Data blocks don't discriminate, right? We know the Delta guy there is probably an airline transport rated pilot. So we know his abilities, but this guy in the airplane up in the top left there, do we know? 
It could be an airline transport rated pilot flying his 172 on the weekend, or it could be a brand new instrument pilot. But from, just so you understand, from our standpoint, everybody is exactly the same in terms of their capability. Right, so what we're going to talk about today is some ideas, ways that you can um, let air traffic know when you need a little extra help or when you don't like something that's going on. That's the toughest part about being a, a new pilot. Here's a great slide. This is just another beautiful day of flying, right? Just like today. We fly all the time. We never see another airplane from point A to point B other than around the airport. Crystal clear skies, not another airplane in the sky. Right? But this is what it really looks like. We're going to let this build a little bit. The airspace out there today is very complex. It's full of airways. It's full of airspace boundaries. It, it's full of uh, approach controls, class airspace. And then nowadays we have more and more uh, temporary flight restriction areas, MOAs, all this stuff. This is what it really looks like out the window. And from a controller's perspective, we're not only missing airplanes as far as missing, you know, two airplanes passing one another with legal separation. We also have to legally separate from airspace that's around us. I'm not allowed to let an aircraft under my control enter somebody else's airspace. So as the, it, it looks like a beautiful clear day with nothing out there, we also have to consider the airspace that's around when we're separating airplanes. This is how air traffic controllers have to learn to see what they're doing on a one-dimensional plane. We have to, you have to be able to see three-dimensionally to understand what's happening in the airspace. And this is how we view it. The only thing missing from this picture is all these guys. Right, these are all the airplanes out there flying again. And now with ADSB, this might be what it looks like in your yeah. cockpit too. <laughs> so, uh, especially flying in here, you'll right? You'll have a better idea as technology starts to take hold of uh, some of this. You'll get a better picture of the traffic around you, uh, as well as the airspace. There's a lot more than, than meets the eye, is what we're trying to say. How many people here are flying with ADSB now? So you can see all the traffic out there. Isn't it amazing? Yeah. Like my wife just walked in here. We we took a trip. And she had never seen the ADSB ability to see traffic, right? And you know, once you start looking at that, it becomes very distracting, especially if you're a non-pilot. You see all these targets out there, and you're like, is that traffic? Is that traffic? Is that traffic? No, you know, it makes it uh, a little more tense when you see everything that's out there. Before, it's hard to compete with, you know. Before, we didn't know any of that was out there. We couldn't see them. You know, we could hear them on the frequency, but now we can see them. So it's kind of interesting how this all works out. I asked my wife, last year we've got our Stratus with four flight, so we have the ADSB in so we can see most of the traffic, not all. We flew up here to Oshkosh, we put our tent down, the weather was going to be bad, so we actually flew home, left our campsite set up, but talk about a fish swimming upstream. We were leaving Oshkosh on the Friday before it started, everybody else is coming in, and it was our first experience with the Stratus and ADSB. After we cleared all this traffic and my co-pilot wife is calling traffic for me as I'm flying around some weather, I said, uh, so is it better to see all of that or is it better not to see it? <laughs> so it, it was kind of a toss up. We weren't too sure which one was better, but it certainly was uh, almost information overload with all the traffic heading toward us. And that's where we're going with the presentation actually. We're gonna talk about all this data that's out there for us to look at today. I think we all should go outside and watch that. <laughs> all right, so here we go. I think there's just two, right? When it's not so beautiful outside, all right, that's when the goal gets real simple, right? We want to get from point A to point B and follow the pink line, basically, right? It doesn't always work out that way. Right? Weather impacts everything we do in the system today. So that's what we're going we're gonna to kind of roll this into this presentation about a little bit about this weather phenomenon, all the, all the stuff we have in the cockpit these days, and how it all works together. Again, pilots have a choice on whether they fly or not. You sit down, you get your weather briefing, and you decide if you want to fly or you want to stay dry, right? When controllers go to work every day, they don't get that option. In our business, good weather or bad, every airplane that's out there for us has to get from point A to point B. And controllers are 
by name control freaks. We want to have control of everything. We control the airspace around us. We control the structure. Uh, the one thing that really causes us the most difficulty is weather. Uh, in the center environment, uh, it changes the way we get airplanes into and out of busy facilities and busy uh, airports. And when weather becomes an impact, uh, we have no control over that. And we start to have to slow everything down because not everybody interprets the weather even looking out the cockpit window from one airline pilot to another, they're going to interpret what they see on their radar differently than the way we're interpreting it. And of course, the PIC has the, the final call as to which way to go. Uh, when we start to have days like that, uh, we wish we had the choice as to whether to come into work or not. <laughs> right. And you know, just this is a simple picture here, but the weather that we see, that you see outlined here in red, is a different presentation than you have today. We don't get next rad. We just simply show precipitation. Half inch or less, half inch to an inch, or an inch or more of precip. And so when you're out there and you say, Senator, can you give us a vector on the weather? We can't use the term weather. We're only allowed to use the term precip. Not the same thing. So we're not looking at the same technology, which creates a whole other issue for us all, right? And just like other in-cockpit weather, our weather has a delay in it also. And uh, it's, you, you have to learn after a while to interpret that delay. So what we're seeing on our screen, and we like to say this about your target also, your aircraft, we know where you've been. We know where the weather's been. We don't technically know where it is at, at that exact moment. The same thing with the aircraft. That's why we have the separation standards we do, is because we know where that target was, but by the time that data gets to us, you've moved. The weather's moved. So. Uh, that's why we have some of the rules that we have. Everything is sort of historical in the air traffic business. We don't see real time. I know your next rad is six seconds to ten seconds or maybe five minutes behind. Our stuff updates every ten seconds, roughly, six to ten seconds. But it's also an interpretation of what you see in next rad, but dumbed down for just precip. Now, in this example here, you see all these data blocks. It's not very clear, I understand. But when we've got weather like this, everybody wants to go through the same spot. So the guy that's up front, you know, he finds a path. All of a sudden everybody in that sector who you're trying to separate by miles, many miles in fact, everybody gets jammed through, tries to get through one little spot. So as a controller, when everybody's at the same altitude, that's a real problem. So that's when controllers get this term we're going to use today is tactical. Right? This was not planned, but this is what happens. So we're dealing with the reality. We're going to talk about strategic versus tactical here. Um, planning is a strategic portion of what we do, right? Even controllers, when they sit down at a sector, at the beginning of the day, we get a weather briefing, right? And we're also briefed on the flow uh, control things for the day. In other words, what restrictions are in for what airports, for what reason. You may not have any weather in the Midwest here, but you'll have weather out east. So everybody going out east, that impacts. And so we're planning for that in strategic mode. We're planning for de to deal with that right here. So when the airplanes get into Chicago Center's airspace coming from the west, we we'll already have a plan, a miles and trail plan. Those miles and trail plans, those restrictions that you get when you're flying, are there for a reason. That's just so everybody doesn't arrive at the same time. Holding is not something that we do typically anymore in air traffic. When we first started back in the day, that's all we did was hold. You know, everybody just went. You know, everybody took off, got in the air. Once you're in the air, you got to be dealt with. And we would hold all the time and then deal out of the hold, you know, for uh, sequencing. They don't like to do that anymore. It's too expensive. It costs too much gas. So they have flow control. They keep you on the ground. You get an EDCT time, right? Yeah, we don't like to hold. Obviously, it's cost money and having an airplane in the air just sitting in one spot is bad for the airlines. It's bad for us because it's a safety issue. Uh, we might as well, you know, try to space things out on the ground. And again, that goes back to that strategic term, the planning term. And uh, once you're airborne and you start deviating around weather, then it becomes tactical. Then we're starting to think on the fly, we're trying to get creative and accommodate everybody. And Guy's going to be able to relate that to how you plan for some of your IFR flying. Right. Since this is an IFR thing here, this ought to be interesting to go through. This came out of the Purdue study. These are the uh, verbs that uh, associate most directly with the strategic part of flying. Right? This, this presentation, the study that was done by Purdue, was more had to do with weather deviation, but this applies to all flying, uh, IFR flying, and, and center operations as well. 
But when we're flying, we plan, we think, we evaluate, we anticipate things, we sort of project out in the future what's going to be happening when we're in the air, right? We prioritize, and then we make a decision. The decision is, do I want to fly today in this or not, right? Is it, 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 there, there's no law, perhaps, that says you can't do that, but maybe you're not, your personal minimums aren't there, right? On the tactical side, according to this study, we respond to things, okay? We act upon things, right? So we're responding, seeing, acting. We fly our airplane as pilots. We control our traffic as controllers, right? And then we, we this is the action side of the list. We try to avoid the tough stuff, but the stuff we don't want to deal with, right? It may not be tough, but it may mean just not be something you want to deal with as a pilot. We maneuver and we evaluate. There's a common thing here in the evaluation portion. And that's where we're going to draw this uh, to a little tighter um, definition here. Now, these are ATC verbs. I'll let Steve do these. Yeah, we do similar uh, planning, thinking, evaluating, anticipating, projecting, and prioritizing, and then we make decisions. And that is strategic. You do that before you ever sit down at a position to work. When it becomes tactical and you're sitting there, now you have to respond to things. You have to act. We can use radar vectors to slow things down a little bit. Uh, we use, have other techniques for control. Um, we can, you know, again, react and coordinate to get around some of this stuff. But the common denominator between the two is to evaluate. All right, so in this evaluation process as a pilot, you're looking at all these things, you're deciding whether it's within your minimums to try, right? When you're in the air, we're constantly strategically looking at things again. I like to think of it this way when I teach students. Strategic is the things that you plan for, you anticipate, and when it works out right, that's exactly what you do, right? You plan a trip, you do all your evaluation, you look at everything, and everything works out just as planned. That's a perfect day of flying. So we look at the weather, right? We look at our weather charts. We do a flight log. Most of this is done automated now, but we look at the time for fixes. And this is an important thing, that second thing on there. I'll get to that in a second. We file our flight plans. Maybe our route in our flight plan is based on weather that we see or that we've looked at in our planning phase, right? But we file that plan. We pre-flight our plane. We provision our airplane with fuel and the things that we need. And I put this in there the last thing because I don't know how many times I've been up with students that have an iPad that runs out of juice and they don't have a charger where they can access it, right? We don't have to worry about that as controllers. No. They never shut the power Everything's off. Everything's plugged in, yeah. Well, they did once, but it didn't work. <laughs> that was our facility, too. We'll talk about that later. There's no time pressure on this side, though, right? But this you can do at your discretion. You can take as long as you want because you're not in the airplane. The airplane's not running. So you make the decision. You have total control, all right? Air traffic controllers don't necessarily have this. When you sit down at a sector and you take a briefing from the controller who's working it, and you're going to sit down in his place and take over the traffic, you don't take the sector until you're satisfied with everything here. Once you plug in and you're on the frequency, then, it, then you own it, right? Once you get in your airplane and get in the air, then you pretty much own it. You're responsible for what's happening. Tactically, here's the difference. Once the engine starts, we're tactical, right? Now we're, now, we're, now we're on time compression, right? Our time is limited because we only have the fuel in the airplane to get from point A to point B successfully. All right, so we, we climb out, we fly, we evaluate while we're flying, we look at what's going on with the weather, and in the end, we get to land. But it is time pressured, right? We can only fly as long as we've got gas, right? So do you understand the difference? Is it clear on the strategic versus the tactical? Right. Good pilots and controllers are continually evaluating and adjusting their plan to make sure we don't run out of something in the plan, right? We don't want to run out of fuel before we get to our destination or to our alternate or you know, somewhere in the middle. We always want to make sure we've got enough to get around the weather and everything that's out there, all right? Okay, so another way to look at this, the key here, and this really goes for students, especially if you're training IFR students or training controllers, is to recognize when you're in strategic mode versus tactical mode. So I'll explain that in a second. Strategic is part of the plan. We execute the plan, it works out great. Tactical is when things come up that offset the plan, right? Now we're off the plan, okay? The next step is incapacitation, basically, where you are so 
off the plan that you can't function properly in the role as a pilot or the role as a controller. We spent a lot of time. I spent, I was a, uh, an OJTI on-the-job training instructor in air traffic from the second year I was in the agency. The last few years I was evaluating and certifying. I was a DPE basically for controllers. And you see guys when their plan stops working for them, they're in tactical mode, they're reacting. And sometimes it's not something that uh, is foreknown. The airplane has an emergency, someone has to deviate, something happens and all of a sudden you've got to react in all these things. But the thing is you have to reprioritize and get all that done because there is no option, right? In the, in, the, in the flying business, you can opt to take a vector somewhere, go to a different airport, land and get out of the system if you want. When you're a controller, you don't have that option. So you're stuck with what you got and you have to make it happen. That's why it's a tough job. Well, um, that's why there's a lot of parallels between flight instruction and air traffic control instructors. You have to be able to evaluate at what point do you need to step in and take action. And I give a lot of credit to CFIs who are able to sit there and let their students get into enough trouble to teach, but not enough trouble to hurt anybody. And it's well, the same always. thing with air traffic. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we have to determine at what point, when do we need to step in and be, be uh, take over uh, at the cost of a, a learning experience or a lear an opportunity to learn new skills. Yeah, how much rope do you give somebody, right? In the air traffic business, and this is, goes with flying, if you teach flying you know this, that you have a student, you have a certain amount of uh, trust and understanding of how that student you know, absorbs information, what they know, what their limits are. And so as instructors we're constantly pushing, especially when you get to the end of an IFR ticket, let's say, you're constantly pushing that student to see what, you know, to have them go past their limits so they understand when they get there. You know, you, you have to make them understand. They have to know when they're in trouble, right? You can't just continue uh, when things are getting bad. You have to recognize that things are not good. We need to make a different plan. We need to adjust. And, the, and you as an instructor, you not only have to think for them, but now you've got to think, if I'm flying the plane, if I'm handed this in a second here, what am I going to do with it, right? So can I, can I deal with it? You know, so there's two things we're looking at. When you're training air traffic controllers, it's, it's the same thing, only it's on steroids, right? I mean, you have to let the student go. You can see when you're an instructor and you've been in the business a while, you can kind of see things well in advance of what they're coming. You can see what's coming, and you know that the student's not seeing that. So how far do you let that person go? What do you let them get themselves into? And sometimes they work like crazy. I mean, these younger people today, these 20-some, 30-somes that come into air traffic, you know, they're, they're really good at the the game thing, right? That seems to be their, that they're, they're born with it. They know it. They understand it. So it's amazing to watch them do all the computer inputs, right? Because they're right on top of that. But when it gets into the air traffic thing, when they're actually given vectors and separating airplanes, they work so hard to get themselves out of those messes, you know, when it could have been taken care of with just a quick couple of turns early on in the game. As an instructor, though, you have to be able to watch that person do that, let them go, and then know when to jump in and take the frequency. Have anybody ever been flying IFR out here and all of a sudden you hear a different voice come on that clicker? Right? That's because there's a student training in air traffic and his instructor just took the frequency from him. It happens all the time. Yeah, we see it all the time. And uh, it, it, as a flight instructor or as an air traffic instructor, you have to maintain a certain amount of awareness to know what to do once that whole thing falls apart. Once it, you, you let it go to the point where they have gotten themselves into trouble, now you've got to step in and you've got to be able to fix it. So uh, continual awareness, constant awareness of what's happening, what's going to happen. And uh, so we're in that uh, strategic mode, constantly evaluating and then have to get tactical once we take over from a, a, a student who's in trouble. All right, so strategic mode, basically uh, these are anticipated things, tactical things with controllers and pilots is when there's an urgency of the situation, we've got to deal with it, right? When you're a controller, you, it's your ticket on the line all the time when you're training somebody, just like as a flight instructor, right? Um, you know, when you get past the private pilot part of it, you know, when you're a more advanced pilot and you're training for ATP and things, then there's, a, just, there's sort of a, a question as to who's really controlling the airplane, right? Is the guy that's the commercial pilot on my left or because we're working on ATP, does that make me responsible as the instructor? You know, the roles sort of change a little bit, but with a private pilot applicant, a student pilot, for example, the instructor is totally on the hook, and same thing with air traffic. That instructor, it's his ticket on the line. So if something goes wrong and they get airplanes get too close, or something happens, or they violate airspace, it's the instructor that gets in trouble for it, not the student. 
But we've had people in training in air traffic who have simply pushed away from the sector and said, this isn't for me. You know, they get like three quarters of the way into their training, you know, getting to journeyman status and getting checked out and they just say, you know what, that's enough. And that's okay, right? It's not for everybody. It's not something everybody can do. If you, I wouldn't want to come into for 30 years of my career and sit down every day and go, I don't know if I can do this or not. Or I don't want to be here. You know, I'd rather be outside. That's like the IFR pilot that gets into weather, or even a VFR exactly. pilot that gets into weather and says, oh, well, I don't want to do this anymore. Well, no, it's too late <laughs> for that. We've got to do something here. You know, but that's how it works. You know, when you're an IFR pilot, when you first find out, you go out and test the waters for yourself, right? You go out and fly IFR. Ask my wife. We've taken lots of IFR trips that didn't work out as planned, right? She's still flying with me, so that's a good thing. But it's something that you'll talk about the rest of your life if it turns out bad, right? If you have a bad day. Right? You've got to test the waters. You've got to know where your limits are. That's the key here is you've got to know where your limits are. So again, strategic and tactical, I want to make sure we, we understand the point. Technology has created yet another issue for us as pilots, also as controllers. Right? We've got a lot of technology in the airplanes today. Would you agree? I mean, that's why we're all here, right? You can see all this great stuff, you know, uh, see it in our airplanes. I've trained uh, up through all these, and here's what I've noticed is that and again, according with this Purdue study, this technology that we see today actually increases the pilot's workload. It has a, a, an opposite effect than what it was intended to do, right? This was intended to simplify workload. The whole idea behind the technology, the high technology cockpit is to make the workload better for the pilot when times are busy. But what they found out is that the workload is less when times are not so busy but the workload is far amplified when there's stress in the situation. You know, when we've got weather or something going wrong with the airplane. Same thing on the controller side. But here's another one, reduce situational awareness. How can that possibly be? I mean, today there's really, with an iPad and all these things we have in the airplane, it's almost impossible not to know where you are. But what they mean by this is that pilots are not fully aware of everything else that's going on around them, right? When we fly, a, uh, we don't have an autopilot and we didn't have all this great stuff to look at, we were very physically involved in the flying process. You know, we were tact tactically involved. In other words, when you adjusted a, a rate of climb, you felt the pressure of the airplane, you know, climbing. You could feel things, right? When you did turns, you could tell whether it was coordinated or not. Now with autopilots in the airplanes today, they do everything. And so you're sort of out of the loop, right? You're taken out of this loop, this feedback loop that we have. And so it's created a, a, an issue where we don't have, we have reduced situational awareness when it was supposed to give us more situational awareness. And this is a big one, complacency, right? I'm speaking just about flying right now. We'll talk about air traffic in a minute because we have a little different thing on the air traffic side. People have become complacent. They're just, they get tired. I mean, basically, you know, uh, an airline a guy was just talking and had a great conversation over lunch. 400 feet in the air, you know, you're pushing the autopilot. That's what the airlines want. They want you to do that because they want the flight to be smooth they want to save money. You know, all this input from the pilot is not saving them money. It's making things rougher. So people are trained to use the autopilot systems. Anybody here flies Cirrus airplanes, right? With the new perspective, you know, their new avionics system. I mean, literally, the airplane will fly itself point A to point B. Programming is what you do. How do you stay in the loop as a pilot? So it's created a complacency issue. Degradation of basic pilot skills. This doesn't really need a lot of explanation. We can understand that if you're not physically flying planes, Right? You're just going to lose that. Right? It doesn't take very long. It, the study goes into great detail about this, but it doesn't take very long for pilots to lose their basic flying skills when they're completely dependent upon flying that airplane with the buttons right? or with the trim wheel. All right, and lastly, uh, we have this major issue with distraction of incompatible systems in the planes. And by incompatible, I mean they're not compatible with air traffic. Right? Eventually, the whole uh, theory behind the next gen process is to put everybody on the same page but right now you have different weather you're looking at and how many people here fly with iPads and glass cockpits and you've got different you're looking at different information right how do you sort that out right that problem of being distracted by all this is a big issue in the technology part today plus you may see something completely different than the air traffic you may see traffic out there that the air controllers don't see there's all kinds of issues we have today and this is a big part of it. The FAA hasn't quite caught up to that yet. And Steve and I are from the FAA, right? So I can say we're, that here. We're, but we're retired. We're. we're. 
Yeah, well, you know, so yeah. we're actually here to help you guys That's today. Right. So <laughs> what can I say? I mean, th these are the issues with this technology that we have. Here's a little, just a quick timeline here, cockpit modernization. This is, you know, we're going back into the 50s now with this kind of cockpit. I mean, it was a great deal during the day when we had basic instrument panels and we had an artificial rise and look at it. That was a big technology piece back in the day. Right? Then it sort of evolved to having two navcoms in the airplane. That was a big benefit, right? From just going to one to two and not having the coffee grinder radios to having, you know, analog switches you could roll and click and feel. They're tactile, though. Those are tactile things. Would you agree? We could click that and know, right? Today, and then we went, moved on uh, into the 70s. We're into digital radios. Big deal. Again, you know, we had the LED radios with the things, and you had a flip-flop so you can go back to the frequency you were on before without having to write it down and memorize it. And then we moved into the IFR certified GPS stuff. A big deal, right? When Garmin came out with those IFR certified GPSs, that was a big deal. Changed forever the way we navigate today, right? No more signal based stuff. And then here we are today. We're in this great modern technology, high technology phase. Now air traffic, I mean, here's a good little slide. How true is that, huh? <laughs> we are almost there. Believe me, we are there. Okay, that's going to be a fact here shortly. Air traffic modernization has gone through the same thing. I'll let Steve talk about this since that's his that's yeah, we look deal. back into the 30s and 40s, we used to use paper strips to separate airplanes. And, uh, of course, we couldn't accommodate the volume that we accommodate today. Um, we moved from paper strips to a, a radar display as kind of uh, an backup. advisory or backup information. Still use paper strips, time and distance for separation. Uh, back then it was, you know, 10 minutes, 20 miles. Now we move into the digital age, and again, we're... One quick point on that, Steve. You know, back when you train as an air traffic controller today, that's how you learn how to do air traffic, though. We still train our controllers to do air traffic on paper strips. Yeah, it's all memory and visualization. Uh, you don't have a display that you're looking at when you, when you first start out. You're separating airplanes by time and distance. Yep, and that's what we call Parker Brothers Air Traffic Control, right? It's like a game. You have to learn all the rules of the game and be able to apply them every day. And this training period is 12 weeks long. Every day they throw something into the rule book that you have to apply that day and then build from that for the next day and the next day and the next day. And back in uh, 1981 when we had the controller strike, they hired tens of thousands of controllers and they weren't passing in the center environment anyway, but 5% of them. Only 5% of the people that went and applied and went to that school could get through the school and pass the training. Because you really, truly, like in that first slide, you have to be able to visualize everything mentally and remember based on a clock. That's your only reference is a clock and these paper strips and information and stuff you write on the reports that pilots give you. But that's still how they train today. So the guy on the right there, that's the guys that are working what we call non-radar or manual control. And the guy on the left had a bright scope, they called it just a raw radar scope so he could kind of see where things were in case they weren't. Big technology when they were able to lay that scope down Right, and then put these little plastic things on there called, called shrimp, boats. shrimp boats. Yeah, and they, we would write the end number or the call sign of the aircraft, and you'd physically move that along with the target. It wasn't attached electronically. So we would manually, again, tactily, like Guy said, push these along with the target. The trick, though, was that by doing that, all this, right, and writing, you were constantly engaged in the process. You were in the loop on everything, right? It was totally in the loop. You didn't have an option to sit passively by and watch this happen. And there is no autopilot for air traffic yet, just so you know. All right, so next we move on to the, uh, the next generation here. This is the M1 consoles. These were actually in submarines as surplus from the military when we got these in air traffic. And it was a big deal. When I came in in 81, 80-ish something, and Steve came in at the same time, this is what we learned on, on radar. And these were very... Uh non-updatable friendly. So yeah. you came into work every day, the equipment was the same, the airspace was the same, it was too expensive to change airspace or to change move frequencies or do any of that in this analog age. And uh, now when we step into the digital age, these displays change every day when you come into work. They can ch make an airspace change by making a few, key a few keyboard entries. They can change the location uh, for a radio frequency from one sector to another just by making a couple of keyboard yep. entries. It's all done just by touch. So our, our environment became, uh, you know, 
very active and today we're just like your cockpit we sit in front of about six different computer screens that are feeding us information constantly it's all digital now and we have a thing kind of like the iPad that we use that we have all of our approach plates and stuff on and reference materials that we use we used to carry all these manuals and physical books and get the approach plates out and have to look at them when we were giving someone an approach it was required that we actually look to that in fact when we first started in this business back in the early 80s you had to memorize the approach procedures as a controller yeah, so you could so you could read it to the pilot yeah, right, for the ones that in yeah. our airspace alone like chicago center has 281 airports and if you own the airspace to the ground which we did every night on the midnight shifts you had to be uh, familiar with each and every approach but things didn't change then it literally took like an act of congress to change an approach plate nothing changed Right, it was always the same, and that's just the way it was done. Even if they, something was broke or they added something to it, they didn't wait. They waited till the next publication date, and they had to train the controllers on the differences. Right, this is the point I want to make here. Uh, imagine where uh, we talked about the Garmin radios earlier, the G, uh, GPS IFR certified GPSs. That's about when we got this stuff here in the center, right? And we know where the IFR GPS stuff has gotten today in our in our glass cockpits, right? But if you come current to today with this, we still have exactly the same thing. So this has not modernized for air traffic. And that's what you hear about all the time on the, on the TV when they're talking about modernizing the air traffic system, right, and going to a, a privatized version of air traffic so that maybe more of this can get done. It isn't bogged down in some political process that this can be. This is plug and play, but they can't fund it. So we haven't changed much in the past uh, 17 years, basically. Yeah, we've always, the FAA in our technology has always lagged aviation. There's more of a, a monetary push to make improvements in the cockpit than there is to make improvements uh, in our facilities. But understand something else that's uh, you know, equal to that is the, there's a monetary push in the airlines to use automated processes. Right, that's the, the, the driving factor behind the autopilot usage is it's more efficient. It's, it, it's, it makes and saves money for the airlines. Right, so all these things are driven by the same. So here's an interesting slide because one of the things that you hear as a flight instructor and one of the things that you hear as an air traffic instructor is when you're sitting with somebody and you go, okay, what's your plan? How are you going to solve this problem you got here? What are you going to do? Right? Steve can talk about that. We hear that all the time in our business. Yeah, that's a good slide because it shows the exact same uh, weather that, and the differences between what we show on our displays and what you show on your display. Uh, much more detail in the uh, in-cockpit display than we get on our radar displays. And you know, and, and training controllers, you know, you'll, they're working hard, they're trying all this stuff, and, and they don't even see, sometimes they're so caught up in the moment, they don't even see what's coming over here in another five minutes for them. And so when the instructor says, hey, what's your plan with those guys? Or what's your plan? That's like a trigger, right? And the controller turns around and goes, what? <laughs> what? What are you talking about? And they say, well, you know, hang on. You'll find out, right? You've got to have a plan for this stuff. You can't just let this stuff go. They get so caught up in this moment, they forget about what's happening over here. And that's the thing about controlling is it's a juggling process all the time. Again, you don't have the option to opt out. Right? No one's going to come over and give you a break just because you want one. Right, the actions we take are, are again strategic, so or tactical. So let's uh, let's dig into this a little bit further here, and we're going to get close on our time. Here's some famous words from a air traffic controller slant pilot. All this strategy seems to work great until the engines start, right, or until the war starts. All right, but nothing works out better than a plan that you create and you execute perfectly. All right, so the goal is. To do your best to, to have that accomplished, right? Minimize the tactical deviations from your strategic plan, right? And that's what we should try to do in flying. Here's some single pilot resource management considerations here. The five Ps, everybody heard this once or twice? You know, and I, I might not beat these into your head or anything, but there's a couple things on here I want to focus on. We have the plan, the plane, the pilot, you know, all these good considerations, passengers, and then finally the programming. So let's focus on the plan. Right, these are the things that you do when you plan a flight. Right, this is what you should. These are the recommended procedures that we showed earlier on in those pictures. All right, so we're looking at all of the data we have. We're simulating all that. We're going through it all, filtering out and deciding whether we want to fly or not. Right. Here's a whole another thing: the programming. This has become an issue. I can't tell you how many times I've flown with people in their own airplanes. Right, and they they got great equipment. 
but I ask them to do something or we get something from air traffic that they're not expecting and they can't figure out how to put it in the how do you put it in the GPS right they have very limited knowledge on some of this stuff there's nothing that says you've got to have five hours of training on a on a Garmin 750 before you go flying it right you can put it in and take off and go right that's one of the drawbacks and the other thing is those people that I asked that don't even have the manuals for these things where you can get them they're in the back in a box somewhere right so this is a big important part this is your provisioning part again make sure that you have the stuff that you need up front when you're in the system flying because you know, there's no way to go back and get it if you don't have someone sitting in the back seat you know you got to take a risk right you got to figure out whether it's worth climbing over seats to try to get something like that right and you see that all the time when we're training this is a big one with this programming part people get bogged down with information we have information overload right we can get everything we need on so many different things in the cockpit right all of that stuff and that's pretty much what it starts to look like after a while would you agree this is a big problem today right so how do we figure it out when this is happening to you and things you're looking at all this and none of it's starting to make sense you are in tactical mode right again the key is to identify when you're in when you're moving towards this part of it right go ahead Steve yeah and there are some strategies available uh, that a lot of people don't think about when situations like this happen controllers the majority are not pilots but they have resources at their disposal to help you out when something like this goes wrong. And uh, when you get into this tactical mode, there is a way to kind of pre uh, press the reset button or do a reset process. And the, the uh, controller is available if you let him know that you need something, whatever it happens to be. You can ask for a delay vector. Maybe you're on an instrument approach and something doesn't look right or you get into that information overload situation and you're just not comfortable, tell the controller. Pass that information along. He can always vector you back off again. Now we hope that's not happening at O'Hare because they get a little angry when they start missing gaps. But uh, for the typical general aviation IFR pilot, uh, when you need a couple of minutes, ask the controller to, to just give you a few minutes and, and he'll vector you out of the way put you somewhere where it's safe, you be out of the way, and you can sort things out when you're ready to start over again, you just let them know that. Fly the airplane first, right? Control your traffic as a controller, this is what we do. Fly the plane, right? There's a reset button. I had a, I had a great privilege of uh, recently training a, a, a really interesting guy. He was a Navy SEAL intelligence officer for SEAL Team 6. And the guy was doing his private training and then we started on his instrument training. And uh, all the time we had in the air flying together, we used to fly a lot of cross-country stuff in his own airplane. And uh, he shared a lot of stories. But he had been through the CIA spy school, all of the, the, the unbelievable training that these guys have, right? And he said, he said the number one trick to all this is, is to reset. You know, reset from wherever you're at, no matter what's happened to you like five minutes ago, how bad it might be. Right? I'm not talking about torture and things like that you, people like us can't even understand, right? He says you have to be able to mentally just reset right from where you're at. And that's a great lesson, right, for, for this process, right? So we fly the plane first, right? Simplify the workload that we have because obviously, you know, we're, we're, we're maxed out. So just break it all down into essential basic things. Go back to basic flying. And for some people, that's just not that easy to do with all this technology and the autopilots that we have. But you've got to get back to basics. You have to understand that. This works for controllers too. Make a plan from where you are at that moment, right? I see so many students and air traffic students as well that can't, they get so uh, bogged down in what didn't work out for them. Their plan didn't work, right? This isn't going right. And they can't sort all that out. And they forget, and they're, they're moving uh, past the real time mark and they're not getting what's happening in front of them. They're not seeing anything that's coming, right? It's so, the next minute that matters, not right. the last minute. So that's what you want to keep in mind. So reset from where you're at. Make a plan from right where you're at, right at that moment, right? And this is a big one. This is what most pilots won't do. Ask for a vector or a delay. Now, I'm going to show you a slide here real quick. And, well, don't be pressured is the other thing. We're going to talk about this word unable. But going to number four there, here's a little picture of Oshkosh inbound on the ILS 36 here, right? So 
Has anybody in here ever heard of the term approach gate? A couple. Okay, good. The approach gate is a controller's term, right? What is the approach gate? The approach gate is the point in space two miles outside of the final approach fix on any approach. It's not yeah. depicted on anything, but it's the rule that we have when we vector for an approach, we are supposed to be outside that approach gate when we do the turn on. So Unless we ask your permission. Yeah. Controllers are always taught to vector for outside that control gate, that uh, approach gate. So a good controller is always pushing to vector that airplane with a 30 degree turn on intercept at that approach gate or very close to it, right? That's a good, efficient controller, right? That has nothing to do with being a good uh, tactical or strategic pilot, right? Do you know what the service volume is on a localizer? Anybody? That service volume means what it's flight checked for, right? How, how far out will it extend that it has to be flight checked for or else it's considered unusable? It's 18 miles, right? You could literally have a 15 mile final. If you're getting beat up out there and it's IFR weather and your programming is all messed up or whatever is happening, ask for a 10 mile final, right? Don't let the control, the controller is just being a good guy by putting you on there close because he's being efficient. That's what they're driven to do. And if you're at a place like O'Hare, you know, where they're putting guys on that mark every single 30 seconds, right? And one guy misses it. He misses with one guy. It backs up everything that he's got coming behind him. So everybody has to get a vector to get back, get back into a sequence. It's a, it's a long chain of dominoes that happens. When, but that's not you. You as the pilot have complete control and authority to ask for that from the controller. And he has to accommodate you. He can't say no. He might take you out and turn you away from the airport, which sometimes is a good thing, right? What happens a lot of the times is that, and again, this is hitting the reset button. So ask the controller for a longer final. That's a great request. And when you ask the controller, that controller knows exactly what you want, and that takes the pressure off of him as well. So he can give you a long downwind and a long base, you know, put you on final, give you a 15 mile final on an ILS or a final approach course, and it's perfectly acceptable, right? Very few people ever ask for that. But I train my students to ask for these things because these are things that the controllers will accommodate. Now, that word that was up on the screen earlier, unable, that's one that you need to write down on your hand and use in your vernacular as a pilot. Unable to a controller means no go, no matter what. Off the, it's not, not even an option, right? So when we coordinate on a landline, we're talking to other controllers and someone says, hey, this guy is gonna come over to you at 10,000 or descending to 10 and he's got 300 knot speed, which is maybe different than what you have planned. And you say unable, I don't have to explain myself any further to the guy that just called me and asked that request. He's got to figure out something else, right? Unable means no, flat out no. As a pilot, if you would put this in your terminology and when someone gives you a, a, a weird clearance or something you're not expecting, just say unable. We're unable center, we're unable approach. The controller automatically resets his mind at that very second when you say that word and it's gonna say, well, what can I do then? What do you need? Right? If you don't use that and you say, well, you know, can we get a little closer? He'll say, no, I'm in charge. I'm the controller, right? So you have to, as a pilot, let that guy know that this is no. Flat out no. Unable means no to a controller. No way, no how, ain't going to happen. Right? And he has to solve your problem to your satisfaction. Very few people understand that. Train my students that, and maybe as you're flying, you know, you, they want to give you that quick turn on or last get and just say no. Unable to do that. Or, you know, here's the big one we see today. This is the most common thing. You get on a frequency with an approach controller and he says, yeah, expect, um, expect the uh, vectors for the GPS, one way two seven, right? And so that means you're gonna be on between the intermediate fix and the final approach fix on that line. So you go to your system and you set it up for activate approach, vectors to final, right? And the guy takes you up, points you at the, at the final approach course and says, go direct to the fix the outside fix, right? The intermediate approach fix. It's not even on your list anymore. It's not even in your GPS. The line stops and it's outside the line, right? What do you do then? Unable, right? I programmed it out of my system, out of my uh, machine here. If you want me to go there, I'll have to reprogram it. Give me a vector. That's the trick is give me a vector, right? Yeah, a vector uh, up, and it may, be, may cost you a few dollars in gas because he's going to vector you out <laughs> quite a ways, and then you just let him know when you've got everything reprogrammed and reset. That's the key. It, it, work it at your time frame, not on his. Right. 
you know, the few dollars in gas that Steve's talking about is nothing. Honestly, if you look at a 15-mile final, right, most of the airports that we fly into don't have one right after another, after another, after another. But even if they did, you still have the right. You have just as much right. Remember, you're an IFR pilot, right? Your airplane has just as much right to that airspace as the airline or the guys behind it. It's the same. Nobody gets preferential treatment, right? You have to be dealt with as a, as a pilot under these circumstances. Okay, so just to kind of wrap it up, this is what we see out the window all the time, right? This is what we're used to seeing, but this is what's actually out there. So think strategically, think tactically, understand when you're off your strategic plan, now you're in your tactical mode of doing things. And what we never want to get to is we would never want to go from strategic to tactical to holy crap, right? That's, that's the bad one. Right, it happens with controllers, it happens with pilots, but that's where bad things happen. Right? We can deal with change, we can deal with resetting if you are willing to do that, but never get to the end of the rope where now you're, you can't function anymore. And I've, we see it happen all the time. It happens with controllers, they'll sit and they'll just lock up, literally just like stop talking, because now they just can't sort it out anymore. So the instructor or somebody has to bail them out. Pilots do the same thing in instrument training. As I said, we push, push, push on the instrument side all the time because we want to see and let that person know where their limits are, but when they get there, they're just down. It's over, right? So you have to come up with a reset plan, and that's what we were talking about today. So here's something. Don't believe everything you've heard about air traffic controllers. We've been rather unfairly portrayed in the, in the TV, movies, and media. Would you agree, Steve? Yeah, no doubt. Although some of the guys actually look like that, but I won't go there. It's not as bad as you think. They're not bad guys. They're just guys doing their job like we are, right? But you guys, as pilots, have the authority, final authority, with your airplane, and a controller must accommodate you. He's trained to do that, right? He's got to help you. If you'll do that, we'll try not to believe everything we've heard about pilots. <laughs> Fair enough? That's an even trade. All right, discussion. Anybody got any questions they want to ask? Questions. Here we go, we got a microphone coming from behind here. Are we on? Steve Hannum, uh, oh, we got it. Here, we'll take this one up here. We can, we can talk loud. If we as IFR pilots are not really going with the program, we're having trouble, we're not doing so well, do you guys report us or do we get in trouble if we're... Never. Because no. that's a concern. You know, sometimes you're flying along, give me as much speed as you can, turn here, do this, climb here, this, that, and I'm afraid if I don't do it, I'm going to get an angry letter in the mail. No, that brings up a good point. You know, uh, I'll uh, let Steve jump in here in a second, but uh, as we said, Right. We're, well, first of all, in air traffic, we don't, uh, we don't, we're not FISDO, right? We don't make rulings on how you behave. Only time that that would ever happen is if you bumped into airspace or bumped into the airspace around another airplane that we have. Okay, that's the only time that ever gets reported. But I will tell you that if you controllers, good controllers, know when a pilot's struggling with the, what's going on, and we can tell this guy's a little, you know, shaky. We're not sure. You know, he's not responding right away or he sounds like he doesn't have it clear. You just need to tell that controller what I, what I share with you. Uh, unable to do that, right? I'm not able to do this right now, right? Unable. That's all you got to say. You don't need any explanation. He might say why. Say because it's beyond my capability right now, right? And then he'll accommodate you. No, we don't write people up. That's not what we do in air traffic at all. No, and uh, the guy mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that we've been awarded a couple of national awards for flight assist, and that pilot never even knew that that went that far, that the, 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 uh, our quality assurance office evaluated it, said we did a good job. That pilot, even though he was in IMC, in icing conditions, most of his instruments weren't functioning correctly, and uh, we got him on the ground. All he said was thank you, and he never heard another thing from the FAA. So. Right. Uh, you know, don't be afraid. Don't be intimidated by it. Uh, and if you are, if there is a situation that you're not comfortable, you think there might be repercussions, a NASA report is always a good thing to do, too. A friend of mine had a minor uh, TFR incident, and, uh, you know, right away my first recommendation was get the NASA form filled out, do the interview with the FISDO, have a chat with them, and uh, get it sorted out. They looked at it, evaluated it, said, OK, 
okay, you know, shame on you, don't do it again. So. Yeah, if those TFRs are tough, you know, that's if you really miss something in your strategic plan if you miss one of those. Yeah. They're not forgiving on those, but that's just the way it is. Let's, I want to make a good, uh, you make a really good point here. We'll get to the next question. When there's something that you want to communi communicate to the controller and there's not a uh, prescribed phraseology to cover that, right? Books say, both of ours and yours say, to use whatever plain language you can find to ask, right? And let me just tell you something. We're, we're controllers. We're used to listening to you know. We listen to groups of things all the time. They're always the same order. You know how we talk as pilots and controllers talk back. We're programmed to listen to that. What, what triggers something in our head is when something other than that comes out uh, on the frequency. So if you say center, you know what? I, I'm I'm way past my ability here. Can you give me a hand? Bingo. Right. That controller now knows. We yeah sure absolutely we can help you. You know let's try this. What do you need? Right? You need a turnout, you don't want a longer final, what do you need? Right? What do you need? You just need to get level for a while and reprogram stuff? That's a big problem that we have today. I see it with pilots all the time. So just ask in the simplest, most direct way possible and you'll get immediate help on the controller side. Right? Good question. You got, What's a, got a question back. Go here. ahead. Hey, thanks a lot guys. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of curious with RNAV Direct and all the ADSB stuff today, or, are we going to see less preferred IFR routes over time in the chart supplement, or what, what's what's really the trend there? Is it helping you or hurting you, or just kind of curious? You know, uh, that's a good question. How do you want to answer this? I'll let you go first. I almost think it's getting more complicated with all the RNAV arrivals and stuff, uh, and and that brings out a whole other thing. Um, there's so much structure in the airspace today, and. The newer controllers are used to that continual structure. You come from the flight levels as an airline pilot and go practically to the runway. The airplane follows all of the descent profiles, the descent via clearances and things like that. The airline guys kind of know what I'm talking about. Um, the, there's so much structure in the system. When that structure gets pushed out by weather and now the controller has to become creative, I think we lose a little bit of that when we rely on that structure so much. So some of the ability to be creative and work around uh, unusual situations is lost, just like in cockpit automation. If you're used to pressing buttons, and all of a sudden the buttons aren't working, how good are you when you go back to hand flying? It's sort of the same correlation, the same thing. So to answer your question, um, I don't know, the, the more structure might actually make things more complicated. I think that's a good good answer. Um, you know, those fixes are all over, and they got like, most every one of them has an X, Y, or a W in it somehow, right? Or maybe all three of those. The, the 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 names are almost impossible to pronounce. GPS approach fixes are impossible to pronounce. Some of our SIDs and our uh, instrument departure are really tough to pronounce. You know, so yeah, it has made things a little more complicated. But again, you're the pilot. You want to go direct, and we can't. Uh, we can accommodate. We're always going to accommodate that. You know, unless there's something in the way. Uh, hello, I'm from Central Virginia, and we have uh, wonderful controllers out of uh, Runnick Approach that are helping us. But not 90%, but 100% of the time when we're going into my airport, which only has one approach, two initial approach fixes, but one, mm -hmm. one approach, it's uh, RNAV GPS 28 into Whiskey 24. And the most commonly used initial approach fix is Calvin, but what's really used is vectors. And so, unless we specify or ask, and we're always going to get vectors to find the approach course. That's what good controllers do. And and a hundred percent of the time, when we're on an intercept, they're going to say, "Clear direct Calvin," which is the initial yep. approach fix. Clear uh, RNAV approach, whiskey two four, or they might say two eight. But yeah, right. they say, say two eight. So anyway, as you said, you already understand Calvin's not not there anymore. It right. is on the latest software version. It doesn't go away. But nonetheless, your CDI, isn't, you're not getting any course deviation. You can always go to nearest and go over there. Or There are ways to get there without reprogramming. And of course, a lot of the gurus now just tell us, don't bother ever hitting vectors to final. Just activate that final leg, which is, makes a lot of sense. But anyway, it's just funny. Why do they do it? I, I mean, we, we know they're going to do it, so it's okay, but it's, it's just the kind of... The reason is that controllers aren't trained <coughs> to understand what the cockpit technology is. They've got 
got it displayed on there. They've got the center line, they'll vector the final. They have no clue that once you program vectors, you wiped out all of those post fixes. So the, it's an inability of the controllers to understand the technology that's in the cockpit. That's not unusual. And believe me, when we first started with, our, with GPS approaches, there was very little training for air traffic controllers on how to manage those approaches. Mm -hmm. It was, we treated them just like we did in ILS or anything else. We vector to the approach gate, do a 30 degree turn on, clear the guy for the approach. Yeah. Unless that controller was a pilot, they wouldn't have any idea what you're dealing with. They don't yeah. have an understanding of yeah. their technology at all. And, and even if we do activate vectors to final, we still don't have, in terminal mode, we don't have that uh, no. lateral deviation so, CDI. We're just sort of going at it. Now, I think that's good enough, but... Well, the work, it's a shame that we have to have a workaround for great technology, right? But, uh, but, but again, we... The controllers, what he's doing is he's telling you to expect, because we have to give an expect clearance when we, we give a vector, right? Because there has to be a connection to, uh, for no radio procedures. So he's telling you what to expect. But then you program that, and then he gives you to the fix, because when he gives you the fix, cross such and such at or above, clear for the approach, right? Now it's not in your database anymore. He does not understand that. It's on the approach plate. He assumes that what you see on the approach plate is the same thing as, uh, that, that's in the cockpit, right, in your technology. They don't understand that. There is absolutely no training for controllers on those issues, right? And it really, in GPS approaches, is a mystery anyway. You can't get a vector for an approach course that you can't see, and we don't depict GPS final approach courses on center radar at all. So we can actually put the fixes out there and clear you to the fix and make sure that you monitor your progress over a fix. And that's why you always get reports established from the controller, because he wants to know that you're actually on the approach. He verifies, based on what he sees, that you're on a part of the approach. And then he can take his eyes off you, and you're doing your approach, right? But we do not have an understanding in the controller or well, workforce at all in technology. between the center radar and approach control radar. Right. If you're under approach control, they have a lot more approach information available to them rather than a center that is working the airspace where that airport is at. Best answer for what you just said, though? Unable. You, you told me you expect a vector for the final approach course, and that's what I have set up. I don't have that fixed in my database. The controller has to figure it out from that point on. He has to figure out that you say, well, then what can you take? And I'll say, I'll take a vector to final or give me, give me a chance to get reset up and I'll go to that fix. Well, one, one solution that works without the money is just keep that initial approach fix as your initial approach fix. Right. And, and, and you know that is a local And problem. just follow your vector and get it. Hit the line. <clears throat> right. there, get direct and continue your yeah, Got okay. it. Another question. Over here. Uh, thanks. Jim Sykovich, uh, retired Milwaukee Fizzle, by the way. About six months ago, I was going in, I don't know, either you center guys recognize the name Sykovich? Yeah. yeah, yeah my brother, all right, my brother was there for 25 years. He never answered my question. About six months ago, I had the pleasure, the pleasure of going into uh, Spruce Creek, which is under Class Charlie airspace, and uh, this TBM is uh, a fantastic operation. So we're out of uh, 14 for 8, something like that, and the controller came by and she said, uh, Spruce Creek is at our 2 o'clock position, fly heading 360, descend and maintain 6,000, contact the next controller, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And my buddy said, oh, we don't want to go that way. I said, well, go ahead and cancel, because the airport was over here. He says, uh, oh, by the way, uh, zero, paying a delta, uh, canceling IFR, we're going direct. And she came right back and said, unable. <laughs> oh. Well, so he said to me, being prior FISDO, Milwaukee FISDO, Jim, I said, last to sign altitude, last to sign heading. Let's try to go to the next frequency. Uh, could he have gotten violated for that if we would well, have canceled it, right then and there? You can and cancel anytime you want to. I, well, yeah. I, the, she said, unable. Well, you know what? Uh, she just didn't have enough experience to understand yeah. that she and could do that. I'd give him a caveat here because the next voice was a male voice that said, okay, uh -oh. go to the next frequency and ask them. <laughs> you tell, tell your brother Bob I said hello. They coordinated all that with the next controller, and they yep. didn't want to go back and have to re-coordinate. They didn't want to undo it. You cancel with them. That's probably what happened. All that information that she gave you right at the end was coordinated, and then she didn't want to have to call that guy back. When you make the frequency change and you say we want to cancel, 
then he knows about it and that, that she just didn't want to pass that along. I had a similar situation flying VFR outside the Bravo at O'Hare and I called out a courtesy. I knew the final day were landing to the uh, east. I'm along the west boundary and uh, 7,500 trucking along toward Kankakee and uh, like I said, well clear of the Bravo. I called for advisories. I thought they're vectoring out here. They probably want to know who I am and uh, it was a bumpy day down low. I got on the frequency with the girl. She radar identified me and immediately gave me a descent. And I said, I'm VFR, I'd really like to stay at 7,500. And she says, well, you're gonna be in the way of our final. And then I just said, okay, thank you. I'll squat 1,200. Went about my merry way at 7,500 right. feet. So everything is available out there. Uh, and I'm sure she was angry with me at that point, but I had every right to do that. We've got to wrap it up, guys. I wish we had time for more questions. We're going to be back here on Wednesday. We've got a panel of IFR experts here. We're going to have different controllers from different disciplines. They'll be up here to answer and take questions for an hour from everybody. So thanks a lot.